just outside uh, L'Aquila. And if you, you drive in that, you can take an exit uh, halfway, so in the middle of the mountain, and you drive into an underground laboratory, LNGS. And in one of the largest halls, you will find this uh, detector. So there's here a large water tank. And inside that, as you can see on this, this, this poster, is a support structure with a, a cryostat. And inside that is a, is a time projection chamber. And we'll zoom into that in a moment. And that is really the inner detector of xenon uh, one ton. Um, if you go there today, the water tank is empty. And you'll uh, see that there is actually a slightly larger detector inside uh, xenon n ton. Uh, but we'll, we'll get back to that at the end of the, of, the, of the talk. So you see a few other things here. You see this big sphere here. That's where we store the liquid xenon uh, in case it's, it's not in, in the detector. Um, so you see here, there's a, a, a rather advanced uh, cryogenics and purification system to keep the xenon liquid. Of course, it's a gas at room temperature uh, and keep it pressurized. And very importantly also for this talk to keep it purified to make sure that uh, yeah, things that are maybe emanating from uh, just pipes and the walls of the detector are removed and that way we keep a good uh, good purity of the detector to see signals so well and you have here you have the the DAQ room and here's where you can sit as an analyst and discover new particles at least that's the that's the idea so let's zoom into this this inner detector for a bit um, this is what's, what's happening or what we, we hope to happen. Uh, so here's a dark matter particle. And the idea is that this will hit a xenon atom and that atom will then recoil. Uh, so if it's a, if it's a wimp, uh, then it will interact primarily with the nucleus. So the nucleus will get a little bump and it maybe loses one or two of the electrons, but it, in main part, it will just uh, recoil. Uh, so that will excite the neighboring xenon atoms. Uh, they actually form little xenon-2 dimers, which then decay, and that produces light that's, uh, to which the xenon is transparent. And then we detect with arrays of photomultipliers at the bottom and the top of the detector. So that's the S1 light signal. You see here in, a, in an example, uh, event waveform from uh, uh, nuclear recall calibration data. So S1 is relatively small. As you can see, it's mostly seen by the bottom array. Uh, generally, since there's a bit of reflection on this, this, this interface, but there's also some seen by the, by the top array. So it also ionizes neighboring atoms. So that, uh, that frees up uh, electrons, which uh, we, uh, we, we move upwards with an applied electric field. And once they hit this gaseous xenon layer, they will excite yet more xenon atoms to make a much larger light flash called S2. So that's this very large waveform here. Uh, that is used to reconstruct the position of the event. You can, if you look at the top PMT array, you can clearly see that the pattern is concentrated at one point, so you know where it happened. And from the delay between the S1 and the S2, you know how long those electrons have been drifting, and then you know how deep in the detector uh, things are. And that's very important because if the interaction is right at the edge, it's much more likely to be some kind of uh, radioactive background. Uh, xenon is a very good self-shielding medium, so we, we really focus on the inner events uh, here. Uh, usually these S1 and S2s are, are much further apart, uh, but this is just to get it nicely in, in one picture. The, the average drift time is something like 500 uh, microseconds. So this is not the only process that can make signals. Um, and also for different dark matter models, you can get different signals. Uh, for example, some dark matter models will cause the electron or one of the electrons of a xenon atom to recoil. And that gives a slightly different uh, event. You get a different ratio of S1 and S2 signals, and you can use that to discriminate these two signals really well. Electronic recoils are the, the, by far the most common signals because uh, uh, yeah, any kind of beta or gamma radiation would also produce an electronic recoil. So usually xenon looks for nuclear recoils and that's what WIMPs do, but uh, in this analysis we looked at electronic recoils. So uh, that's the same thing that uh, radioactive backgrounds do, so you have a more, a larger background uh, but you can still look for an excess on top of that background. Okay, so you know xenon uh, primarily from uh, a set of results that we already uh, published, uh, most likely, uh, so uh, most prominently in dark matter nucleus scattering, uh, where we really are the, the leading uh, dark matter detection experiment at the moment. So this limit here is our, our main limit uh, from the same data set as we'll talk about today. Uh, then we did a a uh, low threshold analysis where you look only at the S2 signal, which is a lot larger, so then you can detect it more often. 
uh, that I showed a little bit more. And you can also look at a, um, a different process called the Migdal effect, uh, by which a nuclear recoil actually manifests as an electronic recoil through an interaction that happens there. And uh, if that process uh, exists, it's not been shown in calibration data, but the prediction is simple quantum mechanics. Uh, we also at light dark matter are really one of the leading experiments here. So that I think is a very nice result that you have one experiment uh, playing such an important role in this entire space of, of dark matter models. But of course, the parameter space of dark matter is much wider. There are uh, dark matter models that don't interact with the nucleus that are maybe, maybe prefer to interact with the, uh, with the electrons. Um, and also in those models, uh, we can set competitive limits uh, and usually even world leading limits. As you can see here, for example, for a dark matter electron scattering from our, uh, from our light dark matter paper. And we're also sensitive to other kinds of signals. Uh, there was a, a paper in Nature where we showed that xenon 124, which was maybe if you have an old table of isotopes still listed as observationally uh, stable, uh, we detected the double electron capture a decay for that. And that's the longest uh, half-life uh, known to, to mankind, uh, at least when we discovered it. So today I'm not going to talk about dark matter uh, nuclear recoils, but about electronic recoils. So we did a similar analysis to our main dark matter analysis, but we looked for electronic recoils. Uh, so we can reconstruct the energy of those events from the, the S1 and the S2 waveforms, averaging them together appropriately. And you get a plot that looks like this. So here you see the energy uh, in, in KEV, so that's the reconstructed energy. So the, we don't have a, uh, at these low energies, our, our energy resolution is, is like several KEVs. That's like uh, uh, usually like uh, four bins or five bins wide uh, on this plot, depending exactly where you are, of course. Uh, and here in, in red, you can see our, our best fit background model. And that's not just fit to this data, but fit to a whole lot of other data uh, going up to 210 KEV to calibration data that we took uh, and, and various constraints from, uh, from other measurements of the shape of the waveforms, uh, the distribution of signals in the detector. And then this is what, uh, what comes out as the best fit, taking into account all of the knowledge of the background that we have, detector effects, efficiencies, et cetera. As you can see, and this is highlighted here in, in, in gray, there appears to be an excess uh, somewhere between two and seven keV, but, but most prominent around uh, say uh, two or three keV of electronic recoil events above the background. And our paper, which is linked here, uh, tries to interpret that excess. And that's what I will go through with you today. There's roughly speaking four classes of interpretations. Could be a statistical fluke. Uh, so it's just a random uh, fluctuation. Uh, maybe it's some kind of systematic error that we made, there's some problem with the, the efficiency or the energy resolution. Um, it could be a new background, so some kind of new isotope that's entering our xenon or some, through some other way making new events. And of course, uh, the most exciting possibility is that this is the first sign or hint of some new physics like axions or neutrino magnetic moments uh, or bosonic dark matter. So what I'd like to do with you today is just go through these four classes of interpretations. And since I hope this to be a discussion, I'll just stop uh, after I go through each of these four blocks uh, just to get, to get your question, get one or two questions from you. And uh, uh, yeah, maybe we can uh, discuss a bit before, uh, before moving on. Uh, as Tim mentioned, you can, you can either raise your hand in the Zoom or you can uh, uh, post in the text, or I suppose you can just, uh, just speak up depending on how, uh, uh, how outgoing or uh, shy or whatever you are. Um, so let me stop for questions here, actually. Is there any question just on this, this brief summary? I don't see any hands raised or anything in the chat. Okay. Right, so then I'll, I'll move on to our, to our first class of interpretations, uh, statistical uh, fluke. So uh, I'll, I'll formulate these as a, as a piece of criticism from uh, uh, some uh, imaginary critics. So uh, when you present a plot like this, there's usually somebody in the audience who believes that they've got a, 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 a very good chi-square automatic fitter in their head and says, oh, I, I look at your plot and see nothing significant. Or, even better, they see some other feature in your plot that, uh, for example, here, 
isn't there this, like if I count the size of this area bar, doesn't it mean that there's a three sigma deficit, 17 kV? Uh, so that's that's odd. Uh, we even had some people commenting on the uh, the points in the error bars here, saying that hey, if I look, there's like uh, six points after each other that each have an, an increasing thing. What's the probability of that? Uh, so this can lead into a, a variety of interesting discussions, and like you can compute the probability of these things. Uh, but let's go back to uh, the basics of how do we quantify whether the success really is a statistical fluke or not, because that really determines whether and how much you should be interested in this. And I apologize to people who's, who, who this is the daily bread and butter, but I often find that this isn't intuitive to many people and there are misunderstandings about it. So how do we do statistical testing? We do something called extended uh, unbind profile likelihood uh, uh, testing. And if that doesn't immediately make it clear to you, let me try to explain. So basically we have a machine called a log likelihood ratio tester where we feed in the data and you get out some reading on the dial. And we'll get into calibrating that in a moment. Uh, so the machine has sort of two components. Uh, one is a null hypothesis, which usually doesn't include any new physics, which has some, some knobs, say the, the rates of some backgrounds and uh, the efficiency of the detector. Then there's an alternate hypothesis, which has the same knobs but an extra one uh, corresponding here, for example, to an axial electric coupling. So when you feed your data into a machine like this, it will compute the best possible fit under this null hypothesis and give you a likelihood for that. It'll do the same for the alternate hypothesis, get the best possible fit under the alternate, and then it will compare these two likelihoods to give you a likelihood ratio, which is this, uh, this reading. Uh, so since the, the alternate hypothesis has the same knobs as the null and just extra, is that's usually the case. Of course, it always uh, either doesn't prefer any or it slightly prefers the, uh, uh, the alternate in this case. So how do we make sense of a reading like this? Uh, so then we need to know how would this dial respond under different data sets if, for example, the null hypothesis is true. So what you do is besides feeding in your observed data, you also run it uh, sometimes feeding in your uh, Monte Carlo data. So just generate it from the, from the null hypothesis and that gives you a calibration of this, this likelihood ratio. You can read off where is it pointing for the observed data and count how often would you see such an extreme result. And that would give you uh, the, the p-value, so the probability if the null hypothesis were true, that you would see such an extreme result under this test. And that's an important caveat, right? So this test is hypothesis dependent. So you can't just say, oh yeah, this is a three sigma excess independent of your hypothesis. It depends what hypothesis you specify here, what kind of value you're gonna get out. There are of course hypothesis independent uh, tests that you could do, but they're much less powerful. So we usually don't do that or we just report on that uh, in, a, in, a, in a sentence in the paper or something. So for example, what happens if I feed here, instead of this alternate hypothesis, one with a lot of extra knobs, a lot of extra degrees of freedom, maybe degrees of freedom that you don't need, what happens then? The dial reading doesn't change, right? That's the same. Supposing I don't need these uh, degrees of freedom, but my distribution of dial readings does change. All these extra knobs I can use to fit this Monte Carlo data better every time. So I'm gonna get a higher p-value uh, or a lower significance excess just by adding these extra uh, uh, knobs here in the model. So the significance that you see, they're not just a measure of how good does some hypothesis fit the data but it is also taking into account how generic is that hypothesis. Uh, so sometimes this distinction is captured by saying there are like local and global p-values, like a, a local p-value that's putting in a theory which is highly specific. So for example, you've, you've tuned all of these knobs except maybe one controlling the overall size to one value, one mass, one ratio of coupling constants. And a global p-value is, uh, or global significance is really if you feed in just a generic theory like this, just axions with some couplings, uh, what is the significance that comes out for now? And those give you very different results. Uh, so the way we usually express it is not as a p-value, but we, we put that p-value on a scale. It's, it's, it's not my favorite scale. It's a bit of a difficult one to explain, but it's on the scale of sigmas. Uh, we would have done much better if we would have called it, for example, the scale of sixes. Right, so here's, uh, here's this scale. You see the probability here going from one to one in a billion. And uh, you see here indicated zero, one, two, three, four, five, six sigma. Note it's not logarithmic in the p-values. So 
to, to sigma things don't make a four sigma excess. And you see here indicated what's the probability of this turning a six, turning two sixes, three sixes, four sixes, five sixes. Uh, and for reference, I've added just the, uh, the global significance and local significance of one of the most famous uh, statistical fluctuations, of course, the 750 GV excess, and the, the, one of the most famous discoveries, the, the Higgs boson. Of course, the significance is now much higher. This is just when it was, when it was announced. Uh, as you see, it has an atlas area corresponding to the two lines. Um, so uh, the difference between global and local here, just to reiterate, that means that you allow for example, for different masses here of this, this, this model when you're searching. The difference is higher here for the 750 GV excess because there was a larger mass range where, where, uh, where the LHC scanned in this case. So where do we fall on this, uh, this scale? That's over here. So uh, just going from left to right. So here we have uh, bosonic dark matter. So that's uh, dark matter that's being absorbed by an, uh, by an atom, uh, like a photoelectric effect. We'll get into the mechanisms in more detail later. Um, the global significance of that is not very high. And that's mostly uh, because this doesn't specify a mass. So you have a, you have a knob that can change the model an awful lot. If however you specify uh, which mass you have in advance. So for example, uh, suppose you have always said that dark matter is a boson at 2.3 keV and nobody's listening to me and this is really it. Then this is your moment because that's our best fit dark matter model. And in that case, you would get a four sigma uh, excess. So that's a large difference just through local and global significances. Uh, you got other interpretations. Tresham will discuss uh, neutrino magnetic moment gives you a significance just above three sigma. Solar axions, which is sort of the one we, we most uh, featured since it has the highest global significance. Uh, if you restrict to one specific axial model, uh, where there's, for example, only an axial electric coupling, you get an even higher one. And I suppose if you consider some arbitrary mixture, you could even get a higher uh, local significance. Uh, just one reference, the, uh, the, the, the xenon decay that I mentioned uh, that was the longest half-life observed, that was over here. So, I would say if here you are in Nobel Prize territory and here you are in nature covered territory, then this territory is at least something to pay attention to. Uh, I don't think we can, can, we can certainly not conclusively say that this is definitely a signal, uh, but we're in the territory of what I would call five sixes. So, you know, drawing five dice and getting five sixes, that can happen, but it's a bit odd. You would, you would find that a little weird if that, that would happen to you. So just to close this section off, let me get back to uh, this claim at the very beginning where uh, our imaginary critics said, hey, what about this, uh, this thing over here? Isn't that a three sigma deficit? So now you can understand why that isn't significant. Uh, so first of all, there are here uh, something like 29 bins. So the hypothesis is that uh, there is a bin with a deficit uh, that, that, has a, that has a lot of, that has a very important knob, namely which bin is it? So you can't just count these, uh, these things up. You get a local significance for this region, but the global significance will be much less. Uh, and in particular, uh, what's so special about this particular uh, region of one keV? So here you see the same data again. I indicate here this, this purely local significance without considering that it could have been many of the bins. What if I slightly change the binning? So instead of binning in uh, one keV increment starting from one keV, what if I start at 1.1 and 1.2 or 1.3? It's just a way of presenting the data. Our analysis is completely unbinned. Uh, but what you see is that if you slightly change the binning, this guy can go from something like 3.4 local significance to 1.5, 1.4. So there's also a huge uh, factor or trial factor, as they call it, associated with just, just what particular 1 keV region do you mean? And here I've only restricted to 1 keV regions. What if I go to 0.9 or 1.1 keV regions. So this really isn't a significant observation. The observation we're talking about is here in these first couple of bins, which as you see are, no matter how you bin it, always higher than our, our model, uh, our model uh, would predict. Okay, so that's, that's all I had to say on the statistical fluke uh, as interpretation. Are there any questions on that? Um, uh, so, so just to understand uh, this slide, um, 
in, in terms of signal and, and the way it's shown. So you would sure. say that towards the energy around two or three kilo electron volts where we're talking mm-hmm. about the excess, you would see you would say it close to two sigma detection, right? Because I mean, you see the very first data point, it goes down into the yellow region, which I think is two sigma. Mm-hmm. Um, the second also goes down into yellow and the third one goes down into green. So, so just to understanding that to what extent it's an excess, so you would say it's something around two sigma? Okay, so if, 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 if you have sense. a model that's, uh, sure, let, me, let me try and you can correct me if I'm not understanding correctly. You're saying, hey, I, I want some kind of model independent way of saying how strong is this excess? And I'm gonna do that by looking at this presentation and maybe averaging what this, this, this local significance is. Uh, so that, that can get you some number. Um, we have a, if you really want a model independent test, we have a different one where we say, well, what if, uh, if you look at this region, just what is the, uh, so I think we look between zero and seven or zero and 10, what's the, just the number of events that we saw? And there you see an excess of 50 events, which would amount to like 3.5 uh, uh, sigma. Uh, but that's of course, again, a kind of local significance because we've preferred one particular uh, region. So uh, really there is, no unique model independent way of quantifying this excess or any excess. The best you can do is you put in a very generic theory, like for example, bosonic dark matter or solar axions with arbitrary couplings, and you see what uh, you see what happens. Because that's that's what we uh, what we wanted to do. Thank you. Yes, I mean I wasn't. I'm- I mean, I was just trying to understand it. I wasn't saying that the signal is good or bad. I was just trying to interpret that in terms of signal. So, so thank you. Sure. Uh, another quick question. You, you would always, in general, like your, uh, you know, excess to appear right in the middle of your analysis window, and not in like the second to lowest bin. Um, yeah. So, is it? I mean, I guess. Things are binned linearly, so you're basically just running out of bins. But is how close is that in kind of a log scale to the edge of where you can potentially detect anything in your analysis? Okay, so our okay, so this, this gets into where our where our threshold is. So um, we have basically a 10% efficiency in this analysis up to one kV, and this is uh, yeah, the most is mostly at say like three or four kV, two, three, four. We usually say two or seven is a kind of canonical range. Uh, you can see that here our, our efficiency starts to be uh, very good, like 80 or 90% of our maximum at about uh, three or four kV. So that's that's where the excess is. Uh, it's at least a factor two away from this point where yeah we basically exclude things from the analysis because the efficiency is so low that it's, uh, it, it doesn't make much sense anymore. Uh, we certainly would like the excess to be in the middle of the range, but uh, we kind of exhausted our luck already with this uh, this publication here, which was right in the in the middle of this this range where we're scanning. Uh, so yeah, hoping for two of those excesses, maybe asking a little bit too much. Um, and Christian asks, what's the approximate energy resolution in this range? What's the approximate energy resolution in this range? So you mean over here? Uh, I'd have to check the exact number, but I I think it is around one kV. It's getting slightly worse. I did, it's better relative to the energy, but it gets worse with square root of energy as you as you, as you go up until here. You're you're in the several keV territory, but I'd have to look up the exact number. And uh, finally, Haranya has her hand raised. It's related to the previous question. So you nicely showed in this animation the impact of changing the bin size. So I assume the energy re- resolution is the reason that you chose that bin size. But if you look at, at least by eye, some of these points, they seem to be moving up and down together as if they're mm-hmm. correlated. Um, so to what extent are these bins independent statistically? Yeah, thanks, Iraya. That's a very important point uh, that I that I meant to mention but didn't. Uh, of course, a 1 keV width here at 16 keV, that is much lower than our energy resolution. So there is no kind of physical process that could generate uh, an excess, much less a deficit uh, right here. So you would need to actually have somebody go into the data and remove like all events between 17.2 and 17.4 keV reconstructed uh, energy. Um, so I guess that also relates to your question of how, how these points are correlated. Uh, of course, I'm moving it in very small increments, so the, uh, most of the bin content isn't changing. Uh, but 
yeah, so the, the energy resolution is, is, uh, is, is finite. I haven't quantified like what is the, uh, the statistical probability of the particular motions that you see on this graph. That will be, again, an interesting exercise, but uh, not one we've done. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Tim, shall yeah. we move on to the... Yeah, I see no more hands or questions. Okay, so let's do that. Right, so uh, next interpretation, uh, I imagine an imaginary critting said, ah, this is yet another threshold Dino, as these particles are called. Some kind of uh, detection right at the edge of the threshold. And uh, all you need is some very slight mismodeling of the, and then all this goes away. What's the, what's the excitement about? So let's try to, uh, let's try to address that. Uh, so the first point to note, and I already mentioned this, the excess isn't right at our threshold cutoff. Right, so we have this little bin over here that is right at our threshold, and that doesn't contribute meaningfully to the excess. So if the excess was mostly here, yeah, then I'd really worry that, okay, maybe there's a, some kind of threshold Dino interpretation, uh, but it's actually somewhat before uh, this threshold. Most of it's in a region where detection efficiency is uh, quite fine. Uh, and of course, if it wasn't fine there, then the excess would be even larger. So to explain this, you would need somehow that the detection efficiency increases or goes over 100%. Uh, and near this range. Uh, so just post hoc things just to see how robust this is. So you can double the analysis threshold for one to two KeV. Excess actually grows because this bin doesn't contribute. Uh, the efficiency is an uncertainty in this analysis. So it's one of those knobs that the, the theories can change. What if we fix that knob at zero, one, minus one sigma, where that spread is determined by uh, an independent uh, measurement of the, the waveform shape and how our processor responds to that excess remains uh, stable. Of course, it does change slightly if you, you start messing with these parameters a lot, right? If I change the energy threshold to 5 keV, then I've excluded, there's nothing left. Uh, but there's no reason to do that. The efficiency is completely fine there. Uh, we've used different software versions. Uh, we've done also just trying to do a CS1, CS2 profile like you just for the nuclear recoils. In all cases, you see this, uh, this excess or anomaly uh, still being present. Uh, so, so it's quite hard to imagine a systematic fluctuation that, that can explain this. But of course, that doesn't mean that it is impossible, right? What if we just haven't thought of some, some variation? There's some systematic in our model we don't know. For that, we do an extra test. So we actually inject a, a calibration source into our detector. In this case, we inject a radon-220, uh, which, uh, which produces a, a daughter isotope of lead that produces a nice uh, flat uh, a beta spectrum. Of course, the beta isn't flat, but in this, this small energy range, uh, it is flat enough, so the, the Q value is high enough. So you get a very nice flat spectrum, very high statistics, and you can just see what the model does in that case, and you see that it is flat, and it follows our, uh, our threshold curve. So to explain this success with a systematic error, uh, you need a large systematic error, not right at the threshold, but before the threshold. And you also need some mechanism to explain why that is somehow absent when we actually inject a calibration source into the detector where it does match this model. So that, that, that very much constrains this interpretation of that it is a, a small systematic uh, error. Uh, finally, just to, to emphasize again the point uh, of, is this some like narrow sideband right at the edge? That's not the case. So here you see the events that we saw in terms of the CS1, the, the area of this, this little S1 signal. And here the other area, of the, the S2 signal, which is of course much larger. Uh, so here you see the black dots, that's the events we saw and the little histogram behind it is that calibration measurement I've talked about. So you see it really nicely follows that, except for a couple of outliers, which are uh, the focus of all our attention for the nuclear recall dark matter search. Because uh, we look for uh, WIMPs basically in this region. So then it's also when you start thinking about very small instrumental backgrounds, such as an event that's at the surface, but it's misreconstructed inwards. Uh, there's an accidental coincidence, so an, a lone S1 and a lone S2, or where the, the companion signal is either missed because it's small or it's in a weird region of the detector where we can't see it, accidentally coming together and making an event. These are all very small. As you can see here, they're in a different part of the parameter space. Our access is right next to our prime WIMP search region. Of course, in a WIMP search region, you're, you're just looking for like a, a couple of events. You're not looking for a few percent uh, change in the, 
in the overall level. Uh, so there is, uh, so you do require a higher sensitivity and understanding in that sense in this region. Um, but this isn't an odd side band. This is really right next to the region where we do all of our analysis. So we should be able to understand it. Our calibration data shows that we do. And yet we see an excess here in the background data. So that's curious. Uh, that, that's, that's really all I have to say on this, uh, this question of the systematic error. We can go into uh, more detail if you want. Uh, and there's much more in the paper as we talk about different run selections, etc. Uh, but, but for me, this is the basic argument. We have the calibration data. We don't see it there. We do see it here. That's odd. Any questions on that? Yeah, quick question on this plot. Maybe you said this already, but what is, sorry, what is this AC here? Sure, uh, AC is a, is a terrible abbreviation. It can be alternating current, uh, analysis coordinator, or in this case, it's accidental coincidence. So that is an event where you have these sort of a lone S1 and a lone S2, where their, their partners sort of missing in action, accidentally coming together. And that is uh, primarily uh, here in this, this low energy region. We know that because we can observe just the lone S1 and the lone S2 uh, spectrum uh, separately. I see, thank you. Uh, Christian also asks what the dominant background is around the excess uh, so, and does the composition of that background change at all near the detection threshold? Yeah, so that's a that's a, an important question. So the, this this flat component here uh, that is constrained by all of the stuff that happens afterwards, uh, but it is primarily uh, led to 14. So that's a, a, again a relatively high Q value beta decay and there's also a component from Krypton 85 uh, which if I remember correctly is also a beta decay. Uh, there's some smaller subdominant components like solar neutrinos, and um, uh, there's a there's a plot of this in the, uh, the paper or in the talk. Let me just quickly get it uh, since it is. Let's see where it is. Yeah, so here we go. This is the background model. So here you can see the the energy range. Uh, you can see here in blue the total background model. You see here, um, so this should be the LED 214 uh, model here. And then we have uh, just a variety of smaller components here. Krypton 85 is the next one I mentioned. And then there's a whole variety of smaller things, like here, for example, uh, this Xenon 124, that's the, the thing we, we had this nature paper about. That was this transition that we detected. Uh, but there's also a different nuclear transition that has a very, very slight uh, thing over here. And that's, that's accounted for. You also see here that we actually split the, uh, the science run into two parts. There was one part that was relatively close to where we did neutron generator calibrations, and it turns, which is of course useful for, uh, it mimics dark matter, it's a neutral particle that bumps into the nucleus. But it turns out if you shoot nuclear, nucle nuclei or neutrons into your detector, then all sorts of stuff gets activated. So uh, we can model that, but we're a bit less sensitive in that, uh, in that region. Can I ask a question about the modeling? Mm -hmm. uh, so in, in the Monte Carlo sort of simulation, the generation of the backgrounds, how, how is that done? In, in the paper, it sort of implies, or at least it, 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 the way it read to me is as if you, you have energy depositions and you're applying uh, an energy resolution based on what's measured from calibration data. Um, but I was under the impression that you actually generated uh, individual quanta and actually generate the electrons and, and photons and so forth. Is, could, could you elaborate on how that's actually done? Because there's a, a sort that's of... A, a potential source of systematic at, at threshold if it's if it's not quanta yeah no that's a good point uh, so we actually did uh, both for this uh, this excess uh, the final model that we present is just based off the empirical energy resolution and it indeed assumes uh, that the, the signals for different energies are gaussian uh, which is not exactly accurate we know looking at the data and we have this full model available uh, that relies on some some, some theoretical input uh, uh, so we also tried it with that, and the excess does remain stable if you if you do that. But uh, yeah, the the analysis in the paper itself used uh, an empirical energy resolution based on different calibration sources. And does the significance of the excess uh, deviate much if you if you use the uh, the quanta model? Oh, I, I wouldn't dare to say. Um, I mean, the 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 anomaly definitely remains, uh, but. Uh, so then I, I think this, the change must be small, but I don't have the, the actual number for you. Of course, given that we have the full model, if it did change a lot, 
we wouldn't have keep, kept using the Gaussian one. You know, it would have made no sense. No, yeah. no sure, that's, that's understood. I'm just interested in the, in yeah, the level sure. of systematic there. Okay, yeah. thank you. No, it's, a good, it's a good question. Yeah. You have figure one on the paper uh, among your backup slides, perhaps. Sure, I have the entire paper. That's this one. Yeah, that's that one. So I'm I'm curious about these uh, energy spectra and the perhaps focusing on the ones where you don't take into account the efficiency loss. So mm -hmm. just curves them. Um, so for the Primakov axiom, uh, one would expect a flux at Earth, which is just sort of the smooth bump, mm -hmm. um, yes, centered at around four kV. Um, yeah. And the curve that you have in the expected number of events is is much more featured, and it has this sort of uh, yeah jump going on around 5 kV. Yeah. Uh, what, what feeds into this? Sure, so uh, let me go to the energy, uh, to the flux plot, which actually later in the talk. Um, so yeah, you're right. So for the Primakov action, you have a, a sort of smooth uh, flux coming in. But when you go to the reconstructed energy, there is this, uh, yeah, there's much more. Uh, okay, so when you get to reconstructed energy, it's again smeared out. But in the paper, you saw sort of an intermediate stage of the deposited energy. What feeds into there is the photoelectric cross-section. So the, the process by which we would detect axions or uh, bosonic dark matter, for example, uh, for that matter, is very similar to the photoelectric effect. So you, you have the axion coming into an atom and then an electron gets, uh, gets ejected. So uh, the electronic structure of the atom, uh, yeah, that, that really affects things. So you get uh, uh, a cross-section that has all these, weird, uh, all these weird jumps in it and the positive energy spectrum also uh, reflects that. Okay, thanks. Sure. Okay. Right, so shall I move on to the, uh, the, the next part or? Uh, let's see, uh, Patrick asks if we okay, should sure. have to worry about the dark rate. Um, the dark yeah. rate, um, could you clarify what you mean by the dark rate? Oh, just I'm not sure. I I'm not sure what the how it works in this energy range, but like, mm -hmm. is there any noise in the PMTs? That ah, okay. Doing anything? Yeah, I mean, it's so a different. Yeah. It's I mean, for for electron recoils, there's already like relatively large backgrounds compared to nuclear recoils, so maybe it's mm -hmm. not important. But. Yeah, no, that's a that's a fair point. So you're talking about the, yeah, the dark current of the photomultipliers, just random electrons uh, jumping off the photocathode, so thermally uh, essentially. So that could make a fake as one uh, because these ones are so small. So you would definitely. Uh, yeah, that is a contribution right here in the like two or three photoelectron S1 range, but it doesn't make a fake S2. And it is not that an electron somehow escapes yeah. that PMT and then gets multiplied. So that's, that's part right. of this an accidental coincidence uh, model. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, I think that's everything for now. To okay. Move on to the next. Good. So let's move on to our next thing. We already got into some of this discussion. Uh, Maybe we just forgot some kind of background, right? We just looked at the background model. There's quite a lot of components. Could we've just forgotten some of them? Uh, happened before in other detectors. Uh, why wouldn't it happen here for us? So let's look at the different possibilities. And for that, let's, let's jump back a little bit again and just ask how do you make a signal in a detector like Xenon 120? Basically, there's three mechanisms. You could be a particle that's so powerful or uh, so, uh, uh, ephemeral that you can go through more than a kilometer of rock that we have above our heads and enter the detector. So the particles that can do that are of course muons, but they're way higher energy. They know nothing to do with this analysis. Uh, and the tree knows like from the sun and of course our dark matter particles. Uh, so, so our new physics models uh, involve either an enhancement of the neutrino cross-section or uh, new dark particles. Uh, but for the background, uh, there's two other ways that are very important. You could be a particle, you, have, you could be some source that is at the lab, uh, so preferably very close to our detector, maybe in a pipe or in uh, you know, some, some part of the support structure in the cryostat. And you're capable of going through several centimeters of metal uh, and xenon. Uh, so the, there's a bit of xenon outside our main detector. And of course, of course, we only select the inner part of the detector. So you were able to penetrate that outer layer and get to the central region. Uh, if you're a neutral particle, that's not too difficult. You can be a neutron. There's still quite a bit of spatial variation though. Um, 
Neutrons have a completely different S1, S2 ratio. They would uh, show up here in the WIMP region in the plot. That's why we don't like them, because they look like WIMPs. Uh, so that's why the next detector will have a specific dedicated neutron uh, veto. Uh, and you also see them as uh, sometimes a double scatter. Uh, so they really play no role at all in this analysis. Uh, betas and gammas can do that, but to do that, you need to have a very high energy. Uh, if you have a 1 keV uh, or 2 keV uh, X-ray by that time, uh, your, your penetration length is uh, maybe a millimeter or something like that. So again, no role in this analysis. The real important bit is what if you're a source that can get into our liquid xenon? Remember, our liquid xenon is being circulated continuously. So uh, that implies two things. Uh, you don't have to be there from the beginning. You could be waiting in some pipe for the right moment to jump out and get into our xenon. Um, but even if you do, especially when you have a, uh, you don't decay immediately, you better be staying there. So if you get removed by our uh, uh, purification system, which is based on uh, zirconium uh, getters, uh, then you have trouble actually making events here. So let's look at the different kinds of backgrounds. Uh, there are quite a lot of <laughs> isotopes on the, the nuclear chart. So this is just the ones that uh, we believe uh, matter. Uh, and in most of these cases, there's a good reason for believing that because there have other signatures that we can very easily see at high energy. So lead 14 and krypton 85, those are the, uh, the dominant backgrounds at low energy. Uh, they're accounted for. Uh, lead is part of the uh, part of a, a radon decay chain, and we can see the other steps in the radon chain. And we can fit uh, the uh, just the, the lead spectrum from higher energy regions, and we can bracket it from these other two parts of the, the radon chain. Krypton. Uh, we can actually detect our krypton concentration in the xenon uh, with rare gas mass spectrometry. So we can constrain this and we know that it is not very large, not the dominant background. And that's in large part because we have a distillation column on site where uh, before this science run uh, even started, we distilled our xenon uh, during online uh, operation. And it's very effective at removing the krypton. You've got a variety of isotopes of xenon, uh, which uh, in these two cases all have an energy that's not in our range and they're accounted for. Uh, finally, there's 124 xenon, uh, which is this huge half-life. Uh, and again, that's accounted for because we, we can now uh, measure one of these, uh, these transitions, one of the double electron capture uh, decays. So what about a new kind of source? What about uh, xenon 127 uh, or what about argon 37? So 127 xenon has been seen in other dark matter detectors, certainly in the beginning, has a half-life of about a month. So if you, you just bring your xenon in the ground, pour it into your detector, you're going to see this guy. Uh, our xenon has been in the ground for more than a year before we even started this measurement. So uh, it's cosmogenically activated. Uh, no way that this isotope is still there. It would also have other signatures which we don't see. So we can forget about that one. There's argon-37, which makes a, a peak at 2.8 keV. That would beautifully fit our access. Uh, very comparable to, uh, to axions and the goodness of fit. Uh, however, there, we don't have any plausible mechanism for introducing that. Uh, if it was there from the beginning, then uh, it would have decayed. And in this distillation that we've done, uh, we know it would be removed. And we know that with high confidence because we actually introduced argon-37 at some point in the detector, way after the science run, of course, and checked uh, how soon can we remove it. Uh, and it, it turns out that the distillation column uh, gives it a, a reduction of like a, something like a day and a half or something. So if you've ran this for months, no way this isotope is, is still left if it was there from the beginning. What if it's coming out of some, uh, some other uh, Element. So, for example, what if it's uh, coming into an air leak? We know there's argon in the air, it's not so much xenon, but there is argon, and there could be a bit of this isotope. What kind of air leak would you need? That would be about six liters per day. Give you some context, people start getting very nervous with these kind of detectors if you have a leak on the order of one liter per year. So if we had a leak of six liters per day, all sorts of measurements would be in the red, there would be a lot more krypton, there would be the bad purity, uh, no way we have a six liter per day air in that argon 37. So what's left? 
Well, there is this one isotope called tritium, and that is the focus of some attention in our paper. So let's, uh, let's get into that a little bit. Uh, oh, before I do that, let me mention that we also discussed in the paper for LED 214, uh, is that really a flat spectrum in our energy range? Or is there some kind of enhancement coming from the fact that uh, we have a low energy beta decay, uh, there's basically a bit of extra phase space because you can decay right into an atomic orbital, uh, for example. I'm probably doing the, the nuclear and atomic physics a grave injustice by this, but that's my limited understanding of it. That effect is there. We actually teamed up with an expert on beta decay to try to really set it, to get world leading uh, uh, accurate predictions for this. It's about an order of magnitude less than the excess that we're seeing, so that can't explain it either. Tricia. Okay, tritium has a half-life of 12 years. So uh, we can't evoke this argument that it's been uh, for a year, that doesn't help. It fits the data reasonably well. Uh, so you get a 3.2 sigma here, and that's comparable uh, to uh, neutrino magnetic moment, which is the same significance and a little bit worse than the global significance for axions, quite a bit worse than the local significance for particular models. How could we get tritium in the detector? Uh, well, we could be there from the beginning. Uh, we know there were H2O impurities in the detector. As it turns out, there's quite a lot of water on Earth. So there could be some H2O in there. And we know roughly from, uh, from many other measurements that have been done, what kind of concentration that should be. There is geographical variation, but you can, you can get a rough estimate. Um, but these water impurities will be removed by uh, condensation when we do the xenon gas handling and cooling and also by a purification of the xenon. And if you take even a very conservative estimate for, uh, for these numbers, you get to orders of magnitude less possible tritium concentration remaining than you would need to explain the success. So we don't believe it can be inside the xenon from the beginning. If it's tritium, then it has to emanate from our materials. So what you would need for that is a, a, an equilibrium concentration between emanation and removal by a purification system of 60 parts per billion of uh, water and hydrogen. Of course, the tritium concentration is way, way, way lower than that. It's, it's a very small fraction of the H2O and H2 uh, or hydrocarbon uh, impurities. How do you constrain those kind of things? Well, if you have an impurity that eats photons or eats electrons when they come by, then you can constrain it. because We measure our light yields and our uh, electron lifetime. Right? When we drag these electrons through our xenon, if they all get lost, that has a big effect. So uh, for water, we know that the concentration is around one parts per billion from the, from the light yield primarily. And the same for other uh, electronegative impurities. So you've got an oxygen atom somewhere, it's gotta be very low uh, and nowhere near the 60 parts per billion uh, range. Unfortunately, if you get to hydrogen or some kind of hydrocarbon, we don't have any good direct uh, constraints on this. Uh, so you could try to make an argument saying, well, you know, most of the hydrogen on Earth is captured in water, so it'd be a little bit odd if there's 60 times more hydrogen gas emanating from something than water. But really, that's just speculation. We don't have a specific measurement on how many hydrogen or hydrocarbons are in our detector. So here, we have to throw up our hands and say, yeah, yeah, it, it could be tritium. We don't have a way to measure that. We can't just send a sample of xenon off to some other detector because this is the most sensitive detector for uh, very low concentrations of, uh, of tritium or any other kind of low, uh, low background process. This is the, the world leading detector. So tritium emanating from the materials, it is a possibility, but it does require that there is much more hydrogen or hydrocarbons in xenon long term than there would be water. And other isotopes, at least the ones we can think out, we can think of are uh, you know, ruled out. It's always a strong term, but let's say very firmly constrained, and, and leave it at that. Okay, that's all I had to say on the topic of extra backgrounds. Any questions on that? Yeah, can I can I ask something on the on the argon thirty seven? Mm -hmm. The are you able to? I mean, I I, I completely agree. It, it's unlikely to have been there. You know. It, from, from the start and it would have you know, decayed away. But in case there is some steady state, right, if it's emanating and coming out of some material, then the getter and how it's being removed is, is, is very pertinent. I was wondering if you're able to quantify um, just, that, just that removal rate. 
or, or, or put some numbers on this? Sure. Uh, so we, we did an argon injection at, at one point, as I mentioned, and it's mostly removed by the, the distillation column. And that's removed very quickly, like a half-life time of uh, just over a day. Uh, as for the removal of the getter, we did not test that because that then you have to turn off this distillation. So, sorry, I, I'm, I'm in the distillation, not, not the okay, getter. Yeah. That's my bad. I, I, I just wouldn't expect much since it's an old glass. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> I, I, I guess I'm just asking, you know, what, uh, are you able to quantify? I, I know there was an argon injection we see in the, in the, in the slides, you know, the, the lovely peak that shows the energy reconstruction uh, mm -hmm. at 2.8 kV. But, mm -hmm. but that's a lot, right? That's hundreds of thousands of events in there uh, mm -hmm. and presumably beat down by some, you know, 10 to the high number. But, yeah. but what, what, what is that rate? I guess I'm trying to figure out, you know, what, what emanation rate might there need to be from materials to leave a residual of argon-37, given okay. the very high efficiency okay. of the distillation. Right, so you're saying, hey, there's a third hypothesis for introducing it, not there from the beginning, not an air leak, but could it be coming from the materials? And what kind of rate would you then need? Um, the distillation column isn't really relevant to that because it, it wasn't on during the science run. Um, okay. But, uh, yeah, so I, I, I don't think we have, a, uh, we have a number on that. I, I don't know how much uh, argon is present in, the, in those uh, materials. I don't think it is a part of any... Uh, nuclear decay chain. So unlike, for example, lead, which we get because there's some uh, uranium or thorium chain atom that eventually decays into radon and then makes its way out, I don't think you get that for argon. So you you need to somehow have a mechanism for embedding the argon atoms in metals or something like that. Yeah. Uh, Ruben has a hand raised yeah i have a question on lead 214 um uh this isotope has multiple gamma lines across a very wide energy range and it should be 100 percent correlated with bismuth 214. i guess you've 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 compared it across all these different energies and different isotopes and uh, you saw no inconsistencies so we have done an analysis on the uh uh, bismuth lead uh, coincidences and looking for the alphas that precede uh, a decay chain uh, of lead and, and for both of those we can bracket uh, the energy range uh, sorry the, the rate at which it uh, at which it occurs and uh, uh, yeah our constraint is, is consistent with that but the best constraint is just from fitting uh, from fitting what it is uh, based on the on the data and again it's a flat energy spectrum so that yeah it cannot explain a, a, a rise here near the low energy. Okay, thanks. Sure. I don't see anything else at the moment on this section. Okay. Uh, let me move on to the final uh, section. Uh, so what are the new physics options? Is there a way to explain this with some kind of very nice uh, new physics model, preferably that's not too constrained by anything else, and preferably something that uh, theorists uh, will like? So we considered several options in the paper, um, mostly driven by, uh, so initially, what do dark matter experiments usually search for with this kind of data? So that's uh, axions. And then also later, uh, looking at this data, saying, hey, uh, there's another hypothesis, neutrino magnetic moment which has a very similar signature. Um, and finally, we looked at uh, bosonic dark matter. So that's dark matter that, that, uh, that gets absorbed by the, uh, uh, by the xenon atom. Uh, and so in the first two cases, we're looking at uh, things coming from the sun, either neutrinos or axions. In the last case, we're really looking at just uh, the, the dark matter density and detecting those dark matter particles. So let's start with axions and I'll go here, starting here, and I'll just go counterclockwise uh, uh, like this. Um, you already saw this slide brief uh, briefly. So there are basically three main uh, axion production mechanisms or hypothetical axion production mechanisms in the sun. Uh, ABC stands for atomic de-excitation, Bremsstrahlung, and Compton processes. It basically means that whenever you do something with an electron, some kind of transition or, or scattering, you could end up making an axion. Uh, and that's proportional to the square of the actual electric coupling constant. You have the Primakov process where you're converting photons in the sun into axions, and you've got uh, a particular nuclear transition which 
is a particular type called M1. And please don't ask me what it is and why that is, but somehow this is emitting axions and that's propor proportional to some effective uh, coupling constant squared. Um, so if you transfer this into reconstructed energy, so you take into account the photoelectric cross section that I mentioned, so uh, uh, that you get a factor of axioelectric coupling constant squared. So then you get that and you get our energy resolution effect, which smears everything out. Note this double bump structure, that is because of the structure again in the photoelectric uh, cross section. So you have here the, uh, the ABC axions, which is only dependent on the axioelectric coupling constants. That's what experiments have been searching for uh, previously, experiments of this kind at least. You got Primakov, which depends on both coupling constants and iron 57 uh, likewise. I'm treating these coupling constants, and we do in this analysis, as if they are completely independent. If you ask any axion theorist, they'll likely tell you, well, no, I've got a particular model here that depends on some angles and masses, and that's fair. Um, we're just treating these as independent knobs, and then you can go and see how those convert into, into different axion models, what's the mass, what's the angle, etc. So when you do that, um, you get this model where there are these three free knobs to tune, uh, axioelectric, uh, GA gamma, and GA nuclear effective. And you get a, a very nice fit uh, to the data. Uh, you might even say that it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's slightly unfair, that it's really fitting something here, where there is clearly no uh, significant excess for this. Uh, so maybe you say, well, what if we only tested ABC axions, which, which don't have this, uh, this second extra bump? That actually gets you better significance. So, uh, we actually added these two uh, models later on when uh, we said, we realized, hey, but we're, we're publishing these axion constraints and people are gonna complain that we didn't consider a generic axion model, so let's do that. But classically experiments like ours just search for this and that would give you an even better uh, significance. So that gets back to the point that I mentioned that the significance isn't just how good does the data fit it, it's also a measure of how generic is the theory. So um, you get a global uh, significance of 3.5, and that is high enough that we say, let's publish a, uh, a confidence interval. So that will be a three-dimensional confidence interval uh, on these three parameters. Um, you can project it down onto the two most important ones here, so GA gamma and GA, uh, GAE. If you want to see the 3D thing, it's in the, the talk that I, that I linked. And it is this blue region that is, uh, uh, that is preferred by this, uh, by this result. You see a couple of other lines here. So you see other constraints from Panda X and Lux, other similar dark matter experiments. Uh, you see two axion reference models, DFSC and KFSC, KSFVZ, I should say. There's CAS, that's a helioscope constraint looking at the, the sun with a big magnet and seeing if some uh, axions come out. And then this thing over here, so that is stellar cooling. So uh, this is actually quite interesting. Uh, there is Apparently, a slight hint of some extra uh, cooling in, in, in some stars. Uh, unfortunately, uh, that is at a, a rather different axial electric coupling constant than here, right? So if you make, make axions in a star, that gives you an extra mechanism to cool that star off. If you're the sun, then there's plenty of other mechanisms to cool you off, and that doesn't matter so much. But if you're a white dwarf, or uh, worse, if you're a uh, end of the main sequence uh, star and you're just about to start the helium burning, which is a super temperature dependent process, it really matters if you've got an even slight amount of extra uh, mechanism for cooling. So with astrophysics, you can get set really strong constraints on those kind of production of extra neutral particles like, uh, like axions. And there really is a very big disagreement between uh, the axion that we would prefer, which is over here, and uh, there may be slight hints uh, that uh, the stellar, stellar cooling gives. So uh, yeah, you, you can read some articles about our excess and some people sometimes say, yeah, you know, astrophysics, uh, order of magnitude. I, I disagree with that sentiment. I think this is a very important uh, constraint and uh, it is a strong argument for why you cannot uh, implement, uh, why it is very difficult to imagine a straightforward action uh, excess of this result, but again, we don't want to push any particular interpretation. We did this test, we give you the constraint, we say, hey, uh, you got a lot of trouble uh, dealing with stars if this is the case, uh, but that's what, uh, what, our, uh, what our analysis gives you. So the story is very similar for the second uh, model that we considered, which is neutrino magnetic moment. The neutrinos are produced by the sun, uh, the largest flux is from just the, the PP process. 
and uh, we can detect them in actually various ways, but the ones that is most relevant here is just when the neutrino uh, scatters off an, uh, of an electron. Um, and that process can be enhanced if the neutrino has a bit of a magnetic moment. Now, in the standard model, you already have some magnetic moment because if you really zoom in on a, a, a neutrino propagator, you would see that sometimes there's a little loop where it goes into a W boson and a virtual lepton. So there's some kind of interaction with charged things and that gives you some magnetic moment. And that's really low, that's like uh, eight or nine orders of magnitude lower than what we're talking about here. Uh, if there is such a, a neutrino magnetic moment, that would enhance the, uh, the production, uh, sorry, not the production, the, uh, the detection of neutrinos in an energy dependent way. So you would get uh, a sort of a, a peaked energy spectrum towards low energies. Again, you can fit the data with that. Fits reasonably well, not as well as axions, but very similar to tritium. So you, you don't quite explain this, this very, very high peak over here. And you can't get too high because then you have some problems in this region. You can set a constraint on that. Uh, so that uh, gives you a constraint over here. So that is compatible with uh, the other leading experiments uh, on Earth in this range, which have set upper limits so far. And it is again in strong tension with the astrophysical constraints. Uh, one is from white dwarf cooling, the other is from uh, red giant cooling. We call it globular cluster cooling in the paper, but it has nothing to do with the nanocool cooling of globular clusters. It's the, the stars inside the globular clusters that would uh, get too chilly uh, in this case. So finally, the new physics model, the final one that we considered uh, is bosonic dark matter, where you could have an axion-like uh, particle or a dark uh, photon particle. Um, so this is not, has nothing to do with the sun particular anymore. Uh, this is just the dark matter that's out there um, that could be absorbed if it has uh, a mass that we can detect, right? In these previous cases, the mass of the particle didn't matter. We detected the kinetic energy of the particle. The particle itself should be a very low mass in order to be even viable as an axion. In this case, we're no longer talking about QCD axions. We're just saying, yeah, there's some kind of axion-like pseudo-scalar boson, and that's the dark matter. Um, that could get absorbed and would give you a monoenergetic signature. Uh, so you can set uh, constraints on that. Uh, so that's what we did over here. You can see the sensitivity in green and our actual constraint in, in, in black. Uh, we didn't give a, a confidence ellipse or something like that because the global significance for this model is just under three sigma. And that's what we said at the beginning that that will be the threshold when we publish uh, something like that. So I, I don't have that, that ellipse for you. But I did show and mention that, hey, if you would go specifically to 2.3 keV, you get a, a, a local uh, significance that uh, very much approaches four sigma. Uh, so that, that, could be, uh, that could be interesting. Uh, it's not excluded by any other experiment. Notice that there's also a second Xeno one ton line here coming from the, the S2 only search. And we only look at PS2, and so you're sensitive to a much lower range of, uh, range of energies. And a very similar story applies to dark photons. So that's a dark matter which has some kinetic mixing with regular photons. Uh, here there's actually uh, our stellar bounds uh, from it uh, because there's some, you know, if you mix with photons, then it again affects stellar cooling. Uh, but the constraints are not as, uh, as, as strict here as they are in the case where the particles really the sun and produce. So, uh, so in this case, it is actually a consistent uh, with, if you were to interpret this as a 2.3 kV boson, other bounds that we that we cited over here. Um, whether that's compatible with this this slight hint of cooling, I really do not know. Uh, these are just three uh, sort of points in a very large parameter space set by the imagination of theorists. Uh, there have already been many papers on archive looking. That's how the constraint would be on dark matter standing on one leg and doing something odd. Uh, and many more motivated models. I don't mean to say anything bad about that. That is a vital uh, exercise of trying to find what, is the, what are motivated uh, models uh, for this. Uh, and we just did these three as a kind of benchmark check and to show you that, yeah, this really is probing potential regions of new physics. So before I ask you questions on the new physics, let me just conclude with the summary slide and then we can have the discussion on the new physics and everything else. Xenon one ton excess was published this week. Uh, there appears to be an excess here in the uh, low energy region of like uh, two, three, four keV. 
statistical significance depends on which model you check, depends on local or global significance, but the, the, the region is five sixes. So you don't get five sigma, but at least it's five sixes. And the best uh, global fit is for, for solar axions, 3.5. For systematic errors, it's not right at our threshold. Uh, it's before that. Uh, we tested several things to try to manipulate uh, the model and it, they don't make the excess go away. Most importantly, there are strong calibration constraints, which mean that uh, yeah, you, you cannot modify this model easily or in any way we can think of in a way to explain the success. For new backgrounds, we don't see a plausible way of introducing argon uh, 37 and, uh, for tritium. Uh, that is a remaining possibility. Uh, that we, we, yeah, we, we can say that it wasn't there from the beginning. We know it's not in the form of water because the water eats photons. But if it's in the form of hydrogen and that's emanating a lot more than, than water or it's being removed a lot less, uh, less well, that could explain this success. Um, it doesn't fit nearly as good as axions, but it could explain it and make the tension much less. Finally, new physics models. You got axions and neutrinomagnetic magnetic moments fit beautifully. Uh, you make the astrophysicists uh, very upset because you start cooling their stars and this messes up the color magnitude diagram and it's part of the distance ladder. And uh, so uh, there's tension there. For bosonic dark matter, that doesn't exist, but you need a very specific mass to explain it. So the, the theory is quite generic. Uh, you need this particular 2 keV mass to, uh, to do it. So which is real uh, for that? Uh, as I said, I, I don't uh, want to make any, any strong preferences myself. I would just say that please uh, stay tuned for Xenon Anton. We're uh, working hard on commissioning our uh, the upgraded Xenon Anton detector, which has a, a much larger uh, volume of Xenon, better background reduction, dedicated neutron veto, uh, which should be able to resolve this question within say like four or five months, uh, months of running. There's also other dark matter detectors being commissioned. You have, of course, the LZ uh, uh, experiment and uh, the Chinese experiment, uh, uh, two of a similar scale. So I really think that uh, this is a very interesting hint. And in you know, a few years at most, we will see whether this actually becomes a new kind of discovery for physics. So that's all I had to say. Uh, thanks and happy to take your questions. Thanks. Uh, it looks like we have a, a good number of questions. Uh, Arnaud has his hand raised. We will start there. Yeah. Very nice and interesting talk. Um, Thank you. Have you looked at the time distribution of the excess? The, yeah. Because my, my, <laughs> my, my next question is, could it be due to streaming dark matter? Yeah. Streaming dark matter, okay. Uh, let's, let's look at the time distribution. So this is the, the plot. And very unfortunately, we have an y-axis offset. So please imagine this y-axis going on to zero and then you have the, the time distribution of the excess. So this is, we can't of course isolate the particular uh, roughly 50 excess events themselves. Yeah, yeah. You have to just select uh, one to seven keV uh, and then you see this. So if you fit, for example, a modulation, which I'm guessing is, is, is not what your streaming dark matter would do, but I, I don't know, uh, just a standard uh, sign modulation, that, that, that really doesn't fit any better than just a constant. So streaming dark matter, is, instead of you know, having the earth or any detector just going through uh, a constant dark matter, um, you would have some gravitational effect and you, would, you have a mm -hmm. concentration of dark matter um, based on how the solar system is, is organized. So you would see the dark okay. matter more at certain time of the year and, and, and less and you wouldn't see anything other. Okay. Um, and but it's interesting that, that the, the excess seems to be located in, in a few months in 2017, right? I mean, after that. So that's, uh, that's a very hard statement to make. As you, you can see here that the error bars here on these first points are very large. Remember that the, the y-axis goes on to zero. So I, I don't think it's just these three bins that can explain it. And the reason these have large error bars is that here in the beginning, we did some extra calibrations. So uh, not all of the, the lifetime here is part of this, uh, this science run. Many of it is in a large uh, radon calibration or large neutron generator calibration. So uh, most of the science runs really here later, starting May. 
Okay. And, and then one just short, short uh, second question. So you said you have no sensitivity to the mass range of the axions? Yeah, so we have no direct sensitivity to the axion mass. So it's not like a helioscope where you get a really specific uh, uh, mass range. But what you could do is say, hey, you've now got a, a confidence interval on these three axion couplings. Let me take my favorite axion model and try to interpret that and cast it into a mass range. So we did that. Um, that's over here. So if this success is an axion signal, you take a particular uh, axion model. So here is a DFSC and here's hadronic. I have to say, I don't know exactly what that is, but it's some kind of axion model here. And you get so this, this range of, uh, of around, an, uh, around an electron volt. So, so quite a bit higher than your, your, your usual uh, run of the mill axion models, uh, as far as I understood them. Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, I'll go to one question from uh, Chad and then go to Ruben after that. Um, let's see. Earlier on in the uh, talk, um, Christian asked about the instrumental performance. Are there uh, any degrees of freedom in the efficiencies? Um, and so how would you constrain the energy dependence of the efficiency with the data? So uh, indeed, we have here an, an efficiency, and that, that comes about because primarily because the S1 signal drops below our detection threshold. So if you look back at an S1 waveform, uh, see where it is here. Uh, so this is a very rather well, high energy for our, for our cases. So this is probably uh, uh, just outside the, or the right edge of our plot. Here it's 90 photo electrons, but at the lowest edge of the range, it starts getting to two or three. Requirement that we have is that there are at least three PMTs that see a signal very close uh, to each other. So that the peak must not deviate, I think, more than 50 nanoseconds in these, these three PMTs. So the main uncertainty in the efficiency of that is what exactly is the shape of an S1 waveform. If it is a little bit broader, then that requirement uh, is violated more often than if the signal was a little bit more narrow. So the way you quantify that is you look at, uh, at several uh, calibration data ranges. So we looked at uh, Krypton, which is a calibration search used very often. You get a 40 keV uh, as one uh, peak. And yeah, we also looked at a couple of other energy ranges just to see that there's no kind of energy dependence of it. You can measure the shape quite accurately, especially with a high energy waveform because you, you know exactly where it is. Uh, but there is some uncertainty and that is one of the degrees of freedom in our analysis. So there is here an efficiency uh, uncertainty. And that is parameterized by different ways. So that uh, like plus one or minus one sigma here would mean uh, favoring a different way or a different measurement of these, these S1 uh, waveform shapes. Uh, that's not the entire part of the story. There are smaller efficiencies such as data quality cuts, but this is the main part of the, of the efficiency. It's part of the model and it is constrained by uh, several external measurements. External meaning in xenon monotone, but not this data. Uh, a question from Ruben. Yes, yeah, thanks a lot for an excellent talk. Um, sure. I have a question on the neutrino magnetic moment. It's kind mm -hmm. of a naive question. Does this energy dependent excess, uh, does it come just purely from modification of cross section in UE scattering, or is there some? more complicated maybe modification of coherent scattering with um, misreconstructed events, so it, it's just new. Okay, so you're asking where does this, uh, this peak excess come from in the case of neutrino magnetic moment, and could you imitate that by misreconstructed events? Did I understand that question? Well, yeah, but basically I'm, I'm asking whether this is just new E events, or mm -hmm. there can be some uh, accessing coherent scattering cross-section. Ah, okay, so you're talking about uh, neutrino nucleus coherent scattering. That's right. Yeah, okay, so that's a very important neutrino process that we really hope to see very soon. It has been seen already by the coherent experiment, uh, looking at the reactor neutrinos, if I understand correctly, it was beamed up, I always messed it up, but um, we hope to see it here, particularly the neutrinos from the sun, but when we do see them, they would manifest as uh, nuclear recall events because it's an elastic scattering with the nucleus. So that would, unfortunately, if you're a WIMP enthusiast, push them into this region. 
so in particular here, so they're an important background for, for this region. So uh, they're not an important uh, consideration for this success because they're in a different part of the, the parameter space. Uh, two questions from the chat real quick. Uh, Fouad asks if the um, QCD axion is included in the axion models that fit the data, or is it? I think he's asking, is it mostly axion-like particles? But uh, Fouad, okay. Okay. check me so, if that's wrong. Yeah. So we considered uh, these three uh, axion, uh, so what we considered is an axion model where these three parameters are independent mobs. And that can make, because these are the only three things that we can observe, right? So no matter what kind of complicated action model there is, uh, it always manifests as some kind of relation between these three uh, processes that we, that we observe. Um, so that's what we set limits on. Uh, then there's two uh, reference models, DFSC and KSFZ, that we, uh, we indicate. Um, so which one counts as the, the QCD axiom uh, and what the limits on that would be, I, I don't know. Uh, but we try to make a constraint that's as generic as possible to offer different axiom interpretations, a possibility of using our data. And uh, on a related question, Patrick asks, what's the significance for just the ABC axion? That's, you said, I think maybe that's a better fit. Yeah, so that's uh, indicated. Let's see over here. So that's about 3.8 sigma as significance for ABC uh, axions. Uh, just going in the order that people added themselves, I think. Uh, Chamkor has a question. Yeah, just going back to the issue of the time dependence. Sure. Uh, I guess it's slide 61 on, on Evan's talk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so from from the paper, it, it look maybe I've misunderstood what, something you've said here, but but the SR one, the science run one, goes from February twenty seventeen to February twenty eighteen, and right. you have an overall. So, so the, these first these first few bins are they, these are part of it, right? They are, uh, uh, but not it, so it isn't a continuous uh, one year science run. There were regular interruptions. Oh, well, at the beginning, there were <laughs> once at a time uh, yeah. for particular calibration data. So. You could say they're part of the science run when considered as a as a whole, including calibrations, but they're not part of the, the background exposure used in the search because we injected a big other radioactive source that's doing other things. So, so that, that was my question. So I, I guess if, if the overall science exposure is February, I mean, the paper says something like February 2017 to February 2018, and I get it, in between there are, you know, there's other stuff going on as well. Yeah. But, but what, what, what are these calibrations beforehand that might have sure. influenced these first few bins? Sure. So there's uh, the main thing that we did was uh, so there's a radon calibration and a neutron generator calibration. So the radon, uh, so we inject a radon source uh, uh, that decays very quickly to a stable isotope. So we know that uh, that doesn't influence things long term. But for the neutron calibration, this is a concern. So we did a neutron generator calibration, and uh, let's see, we did that at two points here. Um, so you can see that this is the events in a certain, I think this is the, see, this must be the events in, in a certain, yeah, this is the 131M xenon. So that's one of these activated xenon isotopes uh, that is easy to, to see as this, this giant blue peak over here. And you see that that rate definitely goes up right after the neutron calibrations, but this is very well uh, uh, modelable. Uh, but of course, leaves us a little bit less sensitive to anything that might be going on here for a bosonic DM search. So that's why we split the science run into two parts. And uh, yeah, the excess is present in, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's a combination of, of both. Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, David Marsh has a question. Yeah, th thanks for a very nice talk. Um, sure. So uh, can you go back to the slide about solar axioms? Yeah. So there in the uh, upper right plot where you have the uh, your constraints on the axion photon and axion electron coupling. So I, I just want to understand the, the different regions uh, of, of your constraint. Mm -hmm. So am I right to interpret it as the, the sort of upper left thingy that goes, well, as a non-trivial dependence on GA gamma and GAE, mm -hmm. that's the primacop production. And then the, the vertical thing that doesn't depend on the axion photon coupling, that's the ABC production. 
Uh, yeah, that, that, that's right. With the one caveat that uh, to detect a axion produced through the Primakov effect, there also needs to be uh, some GAE uh, coupling. So we, that's, that's why it's really hard to go GAE to zero. You need to make more and more and more of these Primakov axions in order to, to explain this. Yeah. But for instance, if one would look only at the region, say we consider light axioms and, and we consider that the cast bound is, is a firm bound, mm -hmm. then it's only ABC production that's, that's relevant. Oh yeah, this region okay. is just ABC. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. This extends all the way to uh, to zero. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and a question by David Waters. Hi. Uh, yeah, I'm, it's probably a very naive question, but I, I just wanted to make sure I understood some of the logic around the the, the tritium levels. Sure. I mean, I think you do assume something about relative tritium abundances being similar to atmospheric levels. I mean, are there any fractionation processes in the distillation that could have enhanced the heavier isotopes? And, and have you also taken into account activation of deuterium in the, in the neutron calibration runs? Do, do either of those two, can either of those two things significantly increase the, the, the relative abundance of, of tritium, either in, either in water or, or hydrogen gas? A naive question, but thanks for that. Um, so I, I honestly don't know about uh, about these details of the the quantification. I do know that. So we I'll just go to the slide where we uh, where we try to quantify these tritium uh, levels. Uh, let me get to that. This is background model. Here's tritium. Right. So for cosmogenic activation, we have a quantitative model that. Uh, some production above ground and decay, condensation and, and purification. For emanation, and, and right, so the, the, the conclusion of this is that it is orders of magnitude below the, the fitted concentration. Uh, so for the emanation model, let's see, I think this is much more, uh, much more uncertain. Uh, so we know roughly what the concentration is, assuming that the, uh, the, the H, HT ratio is uh, just its normal ratio. Uh, but for the, the effect of the neutron generator calibration on, on that, I have, I have no idea. And for the distillation, let's see. So yeah, I can see there's, so, well, we didn't run a gas centrifuge, but there would there'll probably be some kind of isotopic uh, effects. Um, I, I, it would be a pure guess if I tried to speculate on this. So I'll, I'll, I'll have to leave that as a, as a question, but it's certainly a good question. Okay, thanks. Okay, any other questions? Okay, if not, let's uh, thank uh, Yale again for a great talk and uh, thank you all for coming and uh, enjoy the, uh, the rest of the summer. Sure, goodbye.